Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the access and for the privilege that we have to feast upon your word. We are keenly aware of how little we know and how infinite is the word of our God. May the Holy Spirit be the one who filters out foolishness and ignorance, but seal to our hearts truth where we long to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name I pray. Amen. We're studying together in the Epistle to the Romans verse by verse, and in our last study together, we essentially finished the 10th chapter, beginning Romans chapter 11. I want to remind you folks again that Paul is not the author of this epistle. He's the writer, but the author is God Almighty. And it is the Holy Spirit who is in breathing the word through the Apostle Paul. We're not concerned with Paul's logic or Paul's reasoning. We are concerned with the word of the living God. The divisions of chapters and verses were added for convenience. In the original documents, there were no chapter or verse divisions. And people get into the habit of reading a chapter a night or, or something like that, and they fail to connect passages of Scripture. When Peter said, Lord, why can't I follow thee now? I'll lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the cock shall not crow until thou hast denied me thrice. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, and because of the chapter divisions, many fail to see that the Lord is comforting Peter by saying, let not your heart be troubled. And that's also true here in Romans chapter 11. We finished the 10th chapter, and we looked at a quotation from Isaiah where the Lord points out that he's held out his hands all day long, stretched out his hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people. That is, contradicting people. The word there, gainsaying, means contradicting. And that leaves us with two popular opinions, both of which, well, are wrong. One is that since Israel is a disobedient and gainsaying people, God wants nothing to do with them. And the other opinion is that God is holding out an offer to them, which they are, they are sovereign in deciding whether to receive or reject. And both of those conclusions are wrong. What we need to see in God patiently holding out his hands to Israel is not the inability of God to accomplish what he desires, but the total depravity of the flesh. I've gone through the biblical proof that man is totally unable to remedy his lost condition, and since he is totally depraved, then it's God who must move toward us, not us toward God. So God is sovereign, not man, and God is not through with Israel. And so we begin the 11th chapter. I say then, as God cast away his people, God forbid. Now that's, that's two words in the Greek. May it never be, may it never come to pass. God forbid. So chapter 11 begins from the flow of, uh, from the end of chapter 10. 
obviously he's held out his hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people. They didn't respond. Therefore, one could conclude that he's cast them away, or, or one can conclude that God is not sovereign in the situation. And we'll get down to the remnant according to the election of grace very shortly. But he begins by pointing out that because Israel did not respond, that, that's no indication that God has cast away his people. Absolutely not. That could never, never, never come to pass. The word cast away is an aorist, middle, and one could translate that reject for himself. Did he reject for himself his people? Please don't miss that expression. They're his people. That single aorist tense entirely destroys replacement theology, that the church has replaced Israel. We can read that verse and, and pass over it so quickly. They were disobedient and gainsaying people, but they're His. They, they didn't cease to be His. They always were His. They always will be His. And time and time again, I've tried to point out that there's a difference between redemption and deliverance. No, folks, these are His people. That's the fundamental point that we need to understand. He's not cast them away. Because they belong to him and he's sovereign in the situation. What if Israel did respond? So we're looking at, at sovereignty and God's sovereignty and God's faithfulness. Two, two characteristics of God here. That's the fundamental point that we gotta we gotta grasp. He's not cast him away. What if Israel did respond? And I'm astounded at some of the stuff that I read. Well, Israel had a chance. Christ came proclaiming the kingdom. And if they had just accept, accepted Christ, embraced Christ as their Messiah, then man, what a change it would have made. Yeah, well, it sure would have. There would have been no cross, no sacrifice, no redemption, no ransom, ransom no satisfaction, no propitiation, no, no well, no nothing. Okay, I, and I don't know how anyone could even suggest such a thing as that. God goes to great lengths to point out to us that man is depraved. If Israel had responded, if God stretched out his hand and they responded, then there would be clear evidence that man himself is able to choose or reject his redemption. And then there couldn't be an expression, his people. And there couldn't be a word called grace. Folks, that's just the truth of the matter look to the pit from which you've been digged I chose Abraham alone Abraham didn't want to be chosen I chose him alone they are a disobedient and gainsaying people and so are we so are we the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God they are foolishness unto him and he cannot receive them why do you not believe me because you're not my sheep you don't become a sheep by believing. You believe because you're his sheep. And the reverse of that is what is preached by a Christian world religious system based on human merit. That's the unchangeable fact of the matter. And we can't change that system. We're not supposed to change that system. It's not about us changing that system, but about that system changing its mind, which is the meaning of repentance. So Israel is God's people and we are His people. The sheep of His pasture. Disobedient, gainsaying. Never ever would, would He forsake us. I'm persuaded that nothing is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Not height nor depth. Nothing is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. They're His people. May it never be that He would reject His people or fail to keep His word. He will never forsake you, folks. There's no judgment for you. Most Christians think that they face a judgment. Well, I've got news for you. There is no judgment for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. They're His people, and since they're His people, we see two truths that are going to be highlighted in the 11th chapter. One is that He hasn't cast away Israel. We see His faithfulness here. And two is that He's sovereign. Look at Paul. I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Most people speak of Jews as descendants of Abraham. Jews are descendants of Jacob. 
I am an Israelite. That means I am a descendant of Israel. Jacob, I'm of the seed of Abraham. That means I'm in the body of Christ. Galatians, when he spoke of seed, he said, Not seeds as of many, but as of one to thy seed, which is Christ. And the third chapter of Galatians ends with, with the, the great, the grand statement that if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So these are not all the same thing. I'm an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Jacob. I'm of the seed of Abraham. I'm in the body of Christ, and I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. The one tribe, you know, that stayed with Judah in Jerusalem. We didn't depart into apostasy into the north. So, you know, and I'm proud of this. And, and that's my heritage, says Paul. God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. That's obvious. Look at me. He didn't cast me away, says, says Paul. Was Paul disobedient and gainsaying? Well, he was the great enemy of the church early in the history of the church. We would have been thrilled to hear that, you know, Paul had been captured and put to death. He was the greatest enemy that we knew. And in that condition, in that condition, God struck him down on the road to Damascus. And I'm astounded when I hear people say, well, look at Paul. He accepted Christ. Wow. Yeah. Really? I mean, you look, you get hit with a, a stroke of lightning, knocked down, made blind, and God speak to you from above. Well, I, I don't know. You know, I, th I think you'd probably listen too. And all of a sudden, the great enemy of the church became a great servant of the Lord and giving us the very core of our doctrine. The Holy Spirit used the Apostle Paul, nobody else, to give us the 14 doctrinal books from which we rejoice in all that God has done for us. God hath not cast away His people. Look at me. Don't you know? He says... Well, first of all, this is pro-gnosko, not pro-oida. The popular opinion in, in those who depart from man's total depravity is that God can look down through the quarters of time since God is timeless and He knows whether or not you're going to accept. And so His elect are based entirely upon your will, entirely upon human volition rather than divine volition, and they use pro-gnosko for that. You cannot know with absolute certainty what's going to happen unless you absolutely control the events. And God never uses pro-oida when He speaks of foreknowledge concerning us. It's all pro-gnosko. Pro-gnosko. Pro-gnosko means that that's a knowledge of the individual, not a knowledge of an event. Adam knew his wife. He knew his wife. In the Septuagint, that's gnosko, and she had child. It's an intimate, personal knowledge. It's that He foreknew us. Scripture doesn't, doesn't speak of God knowing us in the terms of knowing what we're going to do. I mean, God's God. I expect God expects us to know that. But knowing us intimately. These are people which He knew ahead of time. Intimately. pro -gnosko, And it's an aorist. He foreknew them. Don't you know? And now here's a perfect tense. You've always known. The language is saying, you should have always known what the Scripture says of Elijah, how he makes intercession to God against Israel, saying, you know, he's, he's pleading to God that they have killed your prophets. They have torn down or destroyed your altars. Dig, dig down your altars, the authorized version says. And I'm left alone. I'm the only guy. And they seek my life. I'll probably shouldn't even say this, but a number of people have told me that I'm the only person left that teaches the Word. And folks, that's a bunch of horse hockey. Okay? If you think the Almighty Eternal God is limited to this small YouTube ministry, then you've got a pretty small mind. God is God and He has His people all over the nation, all over the world. Elijah says, I'm all alone and they seek my life. I'm not going to oppose Elijah, contradict Elijah. I absolutely believe that he felt that he was alone in this. Well, he was on Mount Carmel. There were 400 prophets of Baal and only Elijah. And one could almost stop and scratch their head and say, you know, really, am I right? You know, if there are 400 people here who disagree with my theology, maybe I'm wrong. But that's typical in the Scriptures. Jeremiah was alone. There were the prophets of Baal. 
Jeremiah must have scratched his head and said, wow, they're all saying something different than I am. And I'm going to suggest to you that, that in many ways, it is a lonely walk to stick faithfully to the Word of God. But I have the counsel of God that I'm not alone. It's sort of pathetic to think that God had 7,000 men, and you know I don't know how many women and children, who, who not only were His, but had not bowed the knee to Baal, the very thing that Elijah was complaining about. Why didn't they know Elijah? And why didn't Elijah know them? I, I don't know. Maybe they weren't reaching out to each other. Scripture is silent on that. I believe Elijah really thought that he was alone. Seek my life is in the present tense. They're constantly seeking to kill me. There's no break in that. I'm the, I'm the only one who, that is faithful to God, and they are constantly seeking my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? And well, now we're back in Kings. I have reserved for myself, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not, that's the absolute negative, who have absolutely not bowed the knee to Baal. Now, we had the assurance that God hasn't cast away His people, so we can't reach that conclusion from the end of the 10th chapter. And we have the absolute assurance that the sovereign God has not only not cast away His people, but He is the one who reserves for himself those who are his. 7,000. And Elijah, apparently, didn't know any of it. Even so, at this present time, also, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. The word election there is in the accusative. Therefore, it can't be an attributive uh, genitive. It's, it is grace's election. The grammar is important folks, or the words don't mean anything. The word time there is kairos. It isn't the running of time, chronos, where we get our word chronology, but appointed time. The text is saying that in past time, God completely had an, an election according to grace, and, and we're only looking at the present reality of a past completed action. The text isn't saying that he's now electing. The text is saying that even at this present time, there is something that was completed in past time. And, well, that shouldn't surprise us. We have the testimony of Scripture that we were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. The text is telling me that God absolutely completed something he's not doing anymore. So that remnant isn't something that just occurred. I believe the Holy Spirit is going out of His way to impress on us that there isn't a remnant now because they've done anything. That's popular opinion. You know, there's a remnant because these people have believed. There's a remnant because they haven't bowed the knee to Baal. There's a remnant because they're being faithful to the Lord. That's why they're a remnant. But the text doesn't say that. The text says that the remnant, according to the election of grace, is a remnant that was completed in past time. And I point out the grammar because the grammar means a lot, folks. To me, words mean a lot. God says in Hosea, when you come to me, bring with you words. And the meanings of those words and the structure of those words are extremely important if we're to understand them. And it, it is important, I believe, to realize that this is an election of grace. And now we come to the word grace and you see it you read it everywhere we got grace bible church grace fellowship grace this grace that and people come up with you know little ditties to express god's riches at christ's expense when they use that word without knowledge when they use that word without understanding the definition of the word without understanding what it means like a you know for example a grace bible church that really uh well teaches law not grace that's gainsaying. That's contradicting. When grace is one of the, the great attributes of our God, when we were His enemy, when we were hostile to Him, when we were not working for Him, when we didn't believe Him, in fact, when we were opposed to Him, He redeemed us. That's grace. This remnant is something God completed in past time, and He did it purely by grace. It's an easy thing to say that we're His because we accepted Him. But the Scriptures declare that He completed this remnant before they were ever born. 
There's a remnant that was completed in past time. How much choice did you have, you know, before you were born? We were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. What choice did we have before the foundation of the world? Therefore, by the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the elect were made sinners. Even so, by the obedience of the one shall the many be made righteous. And millions believe that we decide whether or not to be righteous, which is not biblical. You had no choice in Adam's fall, and you had no choice in Christ's obedience. This is God's remnant according to grace's election. And if it's by grace, then it's no more of works. Otherwise, the grace becomes no grace. That would be a more literal translation. Otherwise, the grace becomes no grace. If you're redeemed by the grace of God plus anything, then grace is not grace. Mathematically, grace is a constant in the equation. If grace plus something equals eternal life, you know, a variable is whatever that plus is. Everything depends on that variable. Grace means nothing. That's why in 1 Corinthians we're told that we reduce the work of Christ to not, to zero, when we add any works to it. If it's by grace, then it's absolutely not a work. The language couldn't be any clearer, couldn't be any more strong. It is absolutely not of works, because if works enters into it, then grace is not grace. Grace becomes no grace. Now, if you got a more modern translation, you probably don't have the rest of the sixth verse. It goes on. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. The oldest uh, manuscripts have both of those phrases, the positive and the negative expression. The oldest manuscripts do have the last half of the verse. Those two cannot be mixed. We cannot mix grace and works. Yet most churches do. You know, you can hear a, a marvelous sermon on Ephesians 1 that closes with all, you know, the responsibility, to, you know, of, of all of that being heaped upon you. You know, it's up to you whether you accept or reject. And it's not. It's not. You are redeemed, saved, delivered, propitiated. God is propitiated by grace. It isn't anything we do. I can't imagine any other truth of Scripture, folks, bringing us more peace and, and rest and joy than God having accomplished our redemption. And much more than that, being reconciled by His death, we shall be saved, that is, delivered by His life. It is God who not only has not rejected His people, but it is God who absolutely is sovereign man is not sovereign god is there are two families in this book there's the family of the non-elect the non-believer and then there's the family of god's children and they're clearly distinguished by the the personal pronouns the 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 they and the us you know all we like sheep have gone astray the lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all yeah, these personal pronouns are, are extremely important and should be taken note of. How many of the, the us, you know, you're going to leave out? He laid on him the iniquity of us all. Are we waiting to see who the us is? But ye, brethren, have no need that, that ought to be written unto you, for you know perfectly that the day cometh as a thief in the night when they are saying peace and safety. The separation of children of the devil and children of God are very clear in the scriptures, folks. I don't, it doesn't matter whether or not we that it we like that or not. It, it offends so many people. It really does strike a nerve with us, you know, because it, it does. It takes it takes the sovereignty out of God's hands and and, and it hands it to us. It, we're offended. Self is offended that, you know, it's it's it, it really is a a. a a hard blow to man's self-esteem, sense of self-worth, to believe that he isn't in control, that he's not the, the, the captain of his soul, that he's not, you know, his, he's just not in control. And, and folks, that's just not what this book teaches. The separation of the children of the devil and the children of God are, are, are very clear in the Scriptures. Why do you not believe my words? Because, you're, because you are the children of the devil. 
Those were very blunt words spoken by our Lord Himself. There are sheep and goat, wheat and tear, but by the grace of God, He not only planted us, but He has redeemed us. Here in Oklahoma, you know, wheat's a big thing. You know, we know that we don't plant wheat and get corn. You don't plant tear and get wheat. You don't plant wheat and get get tear. In our case, God did the planting. Every every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. And well, what's the opposite? Every plant that He has planted will not be rooted up. And people labor hard behind a pulpit or on a street corner or or, or on Facebook or or Facebook posts or in making YouTube videos. Uh, trying to convince you and me that a Christian can lose his or her salvation because they don't, well, they don't match up to God's expect. They don't meet God's expectations. They, because they don't earn it. But, you know, let's just be let's be honest about it. All right, they haven't earned it. They haven't earned heaven. So, you know, once saved, always saved. Yeah, that's, Steve. I don't want to hear that. That's that's a. That's 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 a heresy. That's a heresy of all ages. Folks, that's not biblical, that's not Christian. That's not brotherly. That's not spiritual. That's not anything that has anything to do with our beloved Lord and his relationship with us and our relationship with him. God never has once forsaken a single one of his beloved children. He never has, he never will, and that is what we are. Until next time, this is Steve. Thank you for all your prayers. We've been hit pretty hard here in the, the Midwest, the Bible Belt, the uh, Heartland, the, uh, the uh, Bread Basket, uh, uh, many, many states. Uh, uh, keep all of those people in your prayers. Until next time, thanks for watching.